the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Mary and Terrell are not just friends of the ministry here. They're part of the family of the Rock. So if you would, let's stand to our feet and let's thank God as Harry and Terrell come and minister the word of God to us tonight. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good evening. Please have a seat. Thank you. Yes, we've been friends of the, uh, the Cobray family for uh, a while. back a before decade. I had gray hair, I guess it was. <laughs> and we've, we've come to know them, love them, and then watch their family grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. <laughs> and now we're on that side where our family's starting to grow again. Thank you. Um, last November on Thanksgiving, uh, um, uh, Roman got married. We have a beautiful daughter-in-law, Stephanie, and uh, so our family is starting to grow. And if they if they get things right, we should have grandbabies anytime soon. Yeah. We're confessing. We're confessing and believing. Rent children. We're, That's grandbabies, right? They come to your house, you get them a lot of sugar, and then they go home. Rent children. Isn't that what isn't that what your parents did? You know, when you <laughs> took your kids over there, my mom would give our kids big candy bars and soda pop, and they'd send them back all jacked up. I'd say, why do you do that? Say, oh, we're just renting them. I said, why would you do that to me? So that's what our parents did to us. All right, I got a couple of things before we start this morning. Oh, Trey is that me? You're okay. making noise. I don't mean. You're to make making noise. lots of noise. All right, turn that on. Turn this one on. Okay, I've got a couple of little things. And our text today is going to come out of. Well, we'll start in Philippians. Is that right, Mom? We're going to start in Philippians. Two. It's where we'll start. So, um, where are my little notes at? Go back to Philippians 2. We were so happy when we got to preach this because this is our favorite message because we've lived it. You know, your best message in your life is your testimony message, your life message. And walking in agreement and the power of agreement is really the whole text of what we want to talk about. And it is our life message because we've been married 28 years and we love to say truthfully we've had 18 amazing years of marriage. The first 10 were just hell on wheels. It was so difficult because I didn't know how to be one. He didn't know how to be one. And and we just, we didn't know how. We just were two people trying to operate as one and we didn't know how. So God dealt with me mostly. And it we used to be to the first three years and it went to seven. It's really how come 10. You now got 10? I'm being as honest as possible now. It was 10 years. It was 10 for me. I, I thought everything was fine for those first 10 years. I didn't know there was a problem in that. And thus, huh? that was the problem. <laughs> if you'd have been more aware. If you'd have cooked better. <laughs> hey, that ship sailed long ago. I mean, if there wasn't smoke in our house, I thought I was in the wrong house. And then her mom comes for Thanksgiving one day, and she turns the on the gen air, and the gen air's not on. She cooks the grill on. I come down, and I'm like... Cheryl, are, are you are you cedar you know uh, smoking something? And no, she's got the the house on fire. Her mom, I said, like mother, you like can daughter. Talk about me, but don't talk about my mama. <laughs> talk about anybody I want to. Because <laughs> you're From the over head here. of the house. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a couple of little things before we get started. What kids say about Mary? This is what a little boy said about marriage he said this is what happens it says the boy said you find somebody who likes the same stuff that you like sports and things like that and she should like it just as well as you do and then watching sports her only job would be to keep the pretzels the the corn chips and the dip coming that's from a 10 year old little boy this is from a little girl it says no person really decides before they grow up who they're gonna marry god decided way before and later you find out just who you're stuck with <laughs> I have a couple more for you. Let's see. They asked the little girl, do you think it's better to be married or just be single? And the little girl said, oh, it's a lot better for girls to be single, but not for boys, because they always need someone to clean up after them. <laughs> and here's the last one. They asked the little boy, says, said, how, do you keep your, how would you keep a marriage happy? And he said, just remember to tell your wife she's pretty every day, even if she looks like a Mack truck. <laughs> Well, Don't you like great. the way kids I love it. look at marriage? <laughs> Amen. So we're, we're, we want to start you on a journey because uh, in, 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 in what we found out over 28 years, and we are, we are really honored to, to be here and to do this about marriage because uh, we normally do marriage seminars once a month all over the United States. And uh, we just did a couple in Hawaii. 
And, you know, if you have a strong foundation in your home, you're going to have a strong foundation for the next generation. So you're not just raising up sons and daughters. You're raising up future husbands and future wives. We don't need to leave it to the television to determine for us what a proper marriage should be. Hello. Because television is an illusion. Television is someone else's idea of what you need to believe. Well, I don't believe what's on TV because none of those marriages are as bad as they seem and none of them are as good as they actually are. Because when I was a little boy, we had Leave It to Beaver. Do you remember that one? With Ward and June Cleaver. Well, I, I know this. I have never came home and saw my mom cleaning the house with a dress and pearls on her neck. Never. Now that's reality. And I've got to tell you, I've never come home and seen my wife acting like Roseanne. Right. That's true. That'll well, never well happen. maybe once or twice. No. <laughs> <laughs> you see the extremes. You see how far we've gone in this world. But even back then, they were giving you a fantasy, which is, is an illusion of how, what a marriage is supposed to be like. Well, they set an ideal up here so high, you can't live up to that because no wife is going to walk around with pearls around her neck. But and God, you can't set it so low. God set marriage in place, though, and he gave us a really good word throughout his word from the beginning to the end of what marriage is supposed to look like, what it's supposed to be like. And when you get your directions from the throne room, it's so much easier to walk out the plan of God in your marriage than it is to try to live some illusion that's not true. But God always gets involved when we're doing it his way. Now, obviously, we can't do it by ourselves. We'll mess it up. We'll, we'll mess up life. We'll mess up marriage. We'll mess up family. But if God gets involved, he will do what we are incapable of doing. For 10 years of our marriage, particularly the first three or four, I prayed and I asked God every day, Lord, change him. Lord, change him. Lord, change him. I mean, I just thought I was fine. He was a mess. And so I prayed all the time, Lord, change him. Lord, change him. Lord, I never prayed where he could hear me, but he said he could feel me. He could I, feel I, me praying. I, Lord, I, change him. I knew she was praying. I could feel it on my shoulders like a chicken pecking at the back of my neck saying, you need to change, you need to change, you need to change. I said, look, they put a crown on your head, not a halo when you won Miss America. You're not an angel here. And, and in my mind, I was so uh, convinced that I was fine and he was messed up. So I just kept praying, Lord, change him, Lord, change him. One day the Lord said to me, he said, I'm going to get involved in your prayer life for your husband. I said, thank you. Teach me how to pray for my husband. He said, pray like this, Lord, Lord, change. I'm like, God, you're not paying attention. I am not needing any change here. He needs to change. Now, if she talked to God like that, how do you think she was talking to me? <laughs> Look, Lord, you're wrong. It's him. I was so convinced, but the Lord began to deal with me. He said, first of all, anybody who thinks that they don't need to change is the person who needs to change the most, number one. Second thing he told me, he said, you are wanting me to change another person and you're praying and asking me to change him as if he's separate from you. But I've made you one. So when you call and ask me to pray and change him as if he's somebody different, you're already saying you're not one with him. So he said, when you pray, say, Lord, change me. And he said, first of all, I'll change you. Second of all, when you say, Lord, change me, he said, you're giving me access to him because it's a great mystery, but two become one. By you saying, Lord, change me and mean it, I will change you. And in the process, you're giving me power of attorney into his life because you're not created or calling him separate from you. So it changed my whole way of thinking. And the moment I started praying, Lord, change me, and I humbled my heart, and I stopped being so prideful, and I asked the Lord to change me, and I truly meant it. I cried out to God, change me, God, because I want our marriage to work. The minute I started praying it right, within days, not weeks, not months, days, our marriage began to change. So it started with my prayer life and the way I was thinking. Now, the, the, the thing that you... The thing that you fall in love with when you first met your mate and the thing that attracted you to them can also be the thing that will try and divide you. Mm -hmm. Rub you the wrong way. I saw Cheryl, now I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I don't have bad sight. I mean, I want you to know, I noticed her first. Amen. Amen. Any of you men you noticed can agree wife. with that? Amen. You weren't attracted to your wife because of her brains. Were you? I said brains, not brain. Did you get, okay, work with me here a little bit. It is Sunday night. 
you're attracted because we are a visual creature. They're an emotional creature. They want to know stability. They want to know security. They want to know strength. Cheryl was attracted to me because she saw some, something in me that was strength and that I would be strong enough to provide a covering for her. And not just, not just saw it. I heard it by the Spirit of God. I walked in a room half as big as this. I walked in one. He was standing in that corner. And the Holy Spirit spoke inside of me. And he said, there's a man strong enough to cover you. Well, I was like, yay. Thank you, Jesus. Little did I know that that strength was going to drive me crazy. That strength was going to make me furious and rub me the wrong way and get all over me and make me feel controlled. And yet God was saying, there's a man strong enough to cover you. Now so I saw thing. someone who was spiritually strong enough that could pray for me. And anything that I did wrong, she could help God make it right. But you didn't like it once you got me. And yeah. I didn't like it once I got him. See, when you ask the Lord to give you the right mate, and then you get the mate God gives you, and they rub you the wrong way, hello, God's trying to fix you. He's trying to change you, and he uses your mate to do that. Iron sharpens iron. No. He brings people into your life that rub you the wrong way on purpose. So you're married to the right person. Yay! Yeah, hey. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> Cheryl and I first met. We met doing a television program. And then we, it, the, the, we never really actually went on a date. We were so busy, but we both had an opportunity to come out to California at that time. I was flying from Oklahoma, she was flying from Texas, and we decided to meet here in California and to pursue a, a relationship because we, we really had never spent any time uh, uh, together. And we, we talked on the phone. And so when I was at the LA airport, you know, you have to come down those um, um, ramps, what are they called in the, the tunnel? Jetway. The jetway. And I, and, I, and I thought, well, I'm, gonna, I'm really going to put on the, the wardrobe tonight. So I wore a black leather jacket, a black shirt, black leather boots, and I had black leather pants on. <laughs> and I finished and my hair was jet black back then. <laughs> I finished a revival in Dallas that night and got on a plane headed to L.A. So I had on a white flowy dress because I'd been singing and preaching. You know, so I had on this white And she dress. comes off of that jetway with the light behind her all dressed in white. And she looked like this angel glowing. <laughs> And now I don't know what you're thinking, but what came across my mind said, there's a good little girl and this bad boy is going to change that good little girl. <laughs> little did I know that she looked at me oh boy. and she said, there's a bad boy and this little girl is going to change that bad Lord boy. Jesus. Guess who won? <laughs> That's why I'm in the ministry today. But the thing that you're drawn to one another, okay, there can be a physical attraction, but looks change. Okay? You can be attracted to a personality, but personalities do change when you, when you go through life. But if there's something that rubs you the wrong way, Satan's going to find a way to always bring that up in the middle between you at any occasion that he can. Particularly if you have a flaw, if you have a personality thing. I, I was sexually abused for 10 years of my life. Harry was, he had carried an abandonment spirit and rejection spirit because his dad died and he, he's Arabic. And, and so it just came, he carried rejection and abandonment. I carried abuse. We brought our stuff into our marriage. And so the enemy uses your stuff that you don't deal with see what you don't overcome will overcome you so if you get in the spirit of God and say I'm going to get over that why because I don't want my kids to deal with abuse I don't want my kids to deal with rejection I don't want my kids to deal with abandonment but if you don't deal with it by the spirit of God your kids will deal with the very thing you would not deal with so it's important that we get in the face of God and deal with ourselves because you're bringing all your junk into your relationship now, we are identified by what we do or what we have or what we say. And I, I, my identity was in my job or my identity was in but what people thought of me or my identity is in what people um, thought they could get from me. And I was a successful businessman, so my identity was there. But when I married Miss America, all of a sudden my identity took a back seat and it was Miss America and him. And him. And misunderstood. <laughs> Miscellaneous. I said him. They got the message <laughs> right off. Me. You're just overflowing with it tonight, aren't you? And you see, that bothered me. I, my identity was, I'm not Mr. Well, I could be Mr. America. I don't know. But, but I was not Miss America's husband. I have an identity. And see, for men, 
it's the first thing that we do. When we walk up and meet someone new, we stick out our hand, we shake their hand, we introduce our name, and then the first thing we say is, what do you do for a living? So you find your identity through what you do. Well, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm married to Miss America. Mm -hmm. No, no, I never I said that. That didn't go very well. When we're in public, we don't even use that she was Miss America. We would say, uh, she, uh, Cheryl, do you remember when you were M.A., <laughs> Miss America? Because I didn't want anybody to know it. But I was proud that she had that title, but it, it rubbed me the wrong way. And so one time she asked me, she said, would you please go with me to the Miss America pageant? It's the 75th anniversary, and they've invited everybody back. And, and if I don't go, I'll be the only one that won't be there. And I said, I don't want to go. I don't like to go. See, I, I know how this sense. thing is going to end up. It's going to end up bad. And see, if I'd have had any sense, I'd have left him at home. You know, because when a, per a man says he doesn't want to go somewhere, guess what? If you make him go, you're both going to be miserable. Here, here's Don't a, make him go to a place he doesn't want to go. That's just a, a, that's a free tip, ladies. Now here, here's another tip. If you ask a man what he's thinking and he says nothing, believe me, honey, we have a way of just sitting there and not thinking about anything. Don't say, you mean you can sit there and think about nothing? Yeah, nothing. you got to be thinking something. No, nothing. But if you say to a woman, what are you thinking? And she says nothing, she's mad at you. <laughs> So we go to Miss America, and I, and I had to wear that monkey suit with the tie and everything else, and we're walking down and we're going into the, the, the ballroom or whatever it was there in Atlantic City, and, and sure enough, the devil was going to get in the middle of us. Because he hadn't dealt with it yet, so the enemy uses what you won't deal with against you every day. So here comes this woman, and she made a beeline across that boardwalk. And she's yelling, Miss America, Miss America, Miss America. And I'm over here, ah, right? And she, ah, and she runs up and she's, oh, I, I've followed you for, for years. I just love you. I watch you on TV. You're just, a, you, I, I just can't tell you. And she says, would it be possible if I have a picture with you? And of course I said, yes. Now I'm over here and this woman has made her way between me and my wife. And she's now in between us. See, this is exactly what Satan tries to do. He tries, he tries to, to get, get any between. way he can to get a division, division sows discord, discord brings in dissension, dissension brings in divorce, and he's done one what he wanted to do. So here he's used this woman to get in between us, and she didn't even know that there was another human being standing next to her. Now, I knew he was upset. I, I knew that it was bothering him from the minute the woman started saying, Miss America, I was nervous. I was like, oh, God, oh, oh God, maybe she's talking to somebody else. Because I knew he was upset by it. But as she got closer, I just thought, well, just deal with it and get rid of her, and that'll be the best thing to do. Because I didn't know what to do. I was abused for 10 years, so I didn't like confrontation. I would do anything to keep from having confrontation I, and that's not even good either because if you won't deal with things the enemy makes sure that you're the weak one all the time and I was dealing with abandonment because my father died when I was 10 years old and I thought he left me so if I let anyone close to me that if I didn't deal with that abandonment rejection spirit that anybody that got close to me I was going to reject them because they were going to leave me anyways and that's See, what this is that does. when she said break every chain you can carry in a chain like this that maybe is like a dog chain, but eventually it'll start feeling like an anchor chain on a big boat. And it's going to drag you down. It'll pull you down. That's why you have to deal with things. And the, and the Lord will reveal these things. He says, when two become one, it's a mystery. You're going to find out the mysteries of what marriage is. And so right. here's this woman in between us. And now she realizes that there's someone breathing over here because, ah, I would like a picture. And I can't take a picture of Cheryl and, and me. So she looks at me and said, hey, you. Oh, and I start cringing. On the hey, side. I'm having you. I am Middle Eastern. Let me tell you, I am not referred to as hey, you. I said oh, to her, I said, I'm, I'm not hey, you. I have a name. It's Harry. Okay, Larry, I want you to take a picture of me and Miss America. Larry? Now, my wife is over here going, just be sweet. Just be nice. Just be sweet. Be nice. I don't mean nothing. Larry's going to get this woman. She hands me the camera. Like, I don't know how to take a picture. She, now, now, you push the little button. Really? Really? You just push just the like little the button, picture. right? Just like the picture. So now she not only doesn't know who I am, but she's come between my wife and me, and now she's telling me that I'm too dumb to take a picture. You see, when you don't deal with something, 
The enemy uses it and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and it was nothing. It was absolutely nothing. But the enemy uses nothing against you when you don't deal with it. So I take the camera. I point it at Miss America and her. And I take a picture. And all she says to me is, thank you, Larry. <laughs> now, Larry, no dummy. Remember, Larry's Middle Eastern. We don't get back, we get ahead. I just covered my fingers over the front of that little lens right there. So when that woman got that picture back, what's she gonna do? Larry's so stupid, he doesn't even know to move his fingers off the front of that thing. That very trip yeah. almost cost us our marriage. Now I'm telling you this, because God uses your baggage, her baggage, and other people to bring division and dissension between you. And the Bible says that two must become one. Once again, I wasn't treating him as if he was one with me. I wasn't treating him. I wasn't loving him to the point I would love myself or my children. And it took us having children for me to realize that I would protect my children to the death. But I let people misuse my husband. I, I let them mistreat him. And I didn't realize I was doing it until the Lord revealed it to me. And if you ask God, he'll show you those very areas that you've allowed to just creep into your relationship. Those little things that you allowed to happen. I allowed that to happen to him. And, and he he said to me, well, you needed to protect me. And I was like, protect uh, no, I, you. I said to you exactly. I said, why did you let that woman do that to us? And I said, well, I didn't do it to you. I can't stop everybody in the world from mistreating you. And he said, I'm not asking you to stop everybody in the world. I'm asking you to stop them one at a time when they mistreat me. Protect me. I'm your husband. Well, that was a shock for me. Protect I said, would you. you allow her to mistreat your children like that? Not. Absolutely not. Would you allow her to mistreat you that way? No. But, but why I did you, if her. two become one? I allowed her to, to mistreat him. And, and when I went to the Lord about it, I said, Lord, I don't understand. He said, protect him. I thought he was protecting me. And the Lord showed me the word for helpmate in the, in the ancient Hebrew. It means his other sight, his other side, his other view, first of all. It means his other sight, his other side, his other view. God gives women as a helpmate to the man. He doesn't give women a helpmate. Did you notice that? He says the Holy Spirit in John is the helpmate to all of humanity. But he gives us as the helpmate, his other sight, his other sight, his other view. He doesn't give us a helpmate because we don't need any help, first of all. First of all. But men need help. So God gives us to help them. And I wasn't helping him. I was hurting him. And the Lord showed me another definition of helpmate. It says his front, his back, and all around him. Like the secret service protects the president, you are to protect your husband. And that began to uh, brought, brought a great realization in my mind that if I don't pray for my husband and protect him, my job is to cover him. Cover him in front, cover him in back, cover him all around. As his helpmate, I'm to protect him in the spirit. And so when I took my place and began to operate as the helpmate, instead of Miss America, I started operating as the helpmate to my husband. God began to heal our marriage. Now let's go into the, the scriptures here. Let's start in Philippians 2, 2, 2 and 3. Philippians 2, 2 and 3. I'm going to read it out New King James. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. Now, I'm going to read it out of the Message Bible. It reads this way. It says, if you've gotten anything out of following Christ, have you? Yes. I mean, you're very, the very breath in your body. You've gotten something from Christ. Yes. The house that you live in, the clothes that are on your back, or even the breath in your body. He says, if you've gotten anything out of following Christ, has his love made any difference in your life? His love has made difference in mine. How about you? Yeah. He goes on and it says, it says if being in the community of the Spirit means anything to you, well, that's or, what church is. Or being one together in unity. Right. If you have a heart. Oh, everybody check yourself. Do you have a heart? It's not just this physical heart. But he says you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. He's talking about that heart after God. Do you have a heart? Do you have a heart after God? Can you say yes? yes. 
But it, it's in a physical manner, but it's, a, it's in a spiritual manner. But in a physical manner, every one of us have a heart. So he says, up to this point, I'm including everyone in this teaching. Right. Then he goes on and he says, if you care. No, that doesn't include everybody. We live in a nation that bar barely cares. We know that because we have no voice. The church is silent. We're saying nothing. We're doing nothing. We, we're not confronting with the word. We're not confronting with the cross. We're not offensive with the blood of Jesus. But we need to find our voice and come to the place to be the church again. To let this nation know that we are one nation under God. And we're taking this nation back for Jesus. Well, if you care, and if ministers cared today, they'd preach the whole gospel instead of Christianity light. Amen. That you must be born again. That Jesus Christ came in, in the form of a human being, was born, was crucified, dead and buried, ascended to heaven, and he lives there, and he gives us the opportunity for what he went through for the atonement of our sins. But you see, if you preach that today, people will say, well, wait a minute, I don't want to offend somebody. I'd rather offend you here than when you stand before the Father, and you're going to have 30 seconds to plead your case, and he'll say, I don't even know you. You see, it took a 95-year-old man named Billy Graham to stand up and tell everybody in America, America's in trouble. Now, we shouldn't have to have a 95-year-old man telling us we're in trouble. We should have men in the pulpit saying, we know we're in trouble, and we're going to find our voice, and we're going to do something about it. I don't care what they say or do to me, though he slay me, I'm going to serve the Lord. We need to find the ability and see you have the ability in your marriage to be the voice Amen. of Christianity today. Because when you look like God in your marriage, it'll look different than what the world looks in other people's marriages. I mean, this guy, this duck guy gets on TV. Now, I don't agree about every, way everything that he said or how he said it, but at least he did one thing. He said, I stand by what I say because it's written in the word. I'm so tired of people that see it says out of your mouth, out of your mouth shall flow what's in your heart. I'm tired of people saying, well, um, you know, this is what I believe and this is what I believe. And then when you get attacked, they say, well, I, I, I retract that. No, stand up with what you say. Stand up and be counted for. Let me tell you, shoot me if you want, but I'm going to go down with the Lord. Because I know I'm not going down, I'm going up. And you see, in your marriage today, marriages are under attack. So he says, if you care, care enough to be godlike in your love for one another. We've got to shake off apathy. We've got to care. When the divorce rate in the church has passed the divorce rate in the world, we've got to care. We've got to shake ourselves awake and say, we are standing for our relationships. We are standing for our families. And I'm not talking about if you've been divorced 50 times. I'm not talking about your past. I'm talking about your present and your future. It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus said in the word through, through Paul he said, I, I'm not dealing with what I've done. If this one thing I do, forgetting those things which lie behind, I press toward the mark. And in Isaiah, he said that we remember not the former things. So God doesn't go back and fix your marriage. He's not trying to get you to go back and fix all the broken relationships you've had in the past. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about not repeating that in the relationship you have right now. Let's move forward with a different attitude and a different word from God. So he says, we, if you have a heart, then do him a favor. Would you like to do God a favor? God is asking us to do him a favor. Anybody here want to do him a favor? I'll do God a favor. About 90% of you would do him a favor. Are you not quite even sure what it would be and you still say you'll do it? All right. We'll he do says, God a favor. What does he want? Love each other. <laughs> love each other. It says, agree with each other. Uh-oh. Wait a minute now. Love each other? Okay. Agree with each other? Are you sure, God? Agreement, that's a whole nother level. Agree? We're different, God, if you haven't noticed. We can't agree on much. You're asking me to do you a favor and agree with him? That's what God is saying. You know why? Because there's power in agreement. Now, you know that the men and women, male and female, were different. Very different. But I, God says agree. I tell Cheryl I'm going to bed. I go upstairs, take my pants off, climb into bed, and go to sleep. Isn't that amazing? Men can, when men say go to bed, they mean it. They, they go to bed. But a woman says, I'm going to bed. She gets up, picks up the house, puts the dishes in the dishwasher, puts the soap in there, closes it up, picks up all the pillows, puts them back in the right place, turns around, goes upstairs, deals with the kids, prays one more time with them, puts them all back in the bed, gives them a drink of water, takes them all to the bathroom. She, then she goes in the bathroom, gets herself ready, does her whole, whole hour routine to go to bed. Then a woman comes to bed. We're different. 
and we've done had our nap. True. It's true. Men get a nap, one little bitty nap, and men are all ready to go again. Men have to have naps. You do know that, ladies, right? They need naps. Men only have like 12,000 words a day. They run out. Well, women, it's statistically they proven. Have women have, have 25,000 words a day. Men have 12,000. By 11 o'clock, my wife calls me and says, can I borrow some of your words you're not going to use today? Because she's done blown through hers by 9 o'clock. So we are different. I keep my we words for that 10 o'clock nap. And then I look over and go, hey, baby, <laughs> what you doing? A little nap, I'll ready to go again. But it's all about learning how to agree. Because if agreement is not fairy dust, it's not, you know, now I pronounce your husband and wife, you're going to agree. No, the minute you get married is when you figured out you can't agree. That, that it's impossible for you to agree without God getting in the middle of it. it on your own, if you could agree, you'd have done it by now. See, now right? it's, it's like if you want to go, go out or you want to go to dinner, you want to go to the movie house, you say to your wife, hey, let's go to dinner. And, you, and, and you're in the car and she's got 20 minutes. And she's back there putting on the, 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 the rouge and the eyelashes and the liner and the makeup and then the hairspray and all. And we get frustrated because it's taking her 20 minutes. We just get in the car. We're different. But, different. but that's scriptural. they got to put that makeup on. The Bible says avoid the appearance of evil. Uh -huh. So let her do what God's told her to do. Uh -huh. We do that because men are turning Christmas on by is time. Christmas already got my present, so... We fix all up because you are turned on by sight. And we don't need you to fix all up because you are not turning us on by sight. You could turn us off by sight, but you can't turn us on by sight. And sounds. <laughs> sight, sounds, and but, smells will turn a woman off. But remember, we're different. She, we are turned on by sight by what she looks like. She's turned on by touch by the way that we just hold her hand. Mm -hmm. Just touch me. See, we're different. You have to understand, God created us different because if he created us alike, then we wouldn't need male and female. He, he actually split himself and said, I'll put my female attributes in her and the male attributes in him. And when they come together, this is a great mystery. But two will become one. Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now, wife, submit to your husband as the Lord. You notice how I just kept reading real fast? Because we don't like that verse. If I could have blotted that verse out of the Bible, because it wasn't that I didn't love the word, it was that I didn't understand that verse. I didn't know how to be submitted to my husband. I'm the strong woman. I have a strong personality. I grew up in the South. I, I grew up with strong women in the South. And then I marry a strong man, and that scripture it offended me. It got in my face. And every time I would read it, God would deal with me. Submit. And, and I'd take it apart. And the Lord said, read it and study it out. So I went through all the Greek and all the Hebrew on the words. And, and really what it meant was to willingly go under the mission of, of a godly home. And, and I could submit because I just did it out of a slave mentality. I'm just going to do it because God said so. But it didn't work. And it all comes back to the getting in the bed. You know, I would get in the bed at night after I'm exhausted, and he's had a little nap now and watched sports late night, and I would get in the bed, and, and he would roll over every night and say the same thing. I would walk toward the bed with my eyes closed, hoping he thinks I'm sleepwalking. <laughs> Maybe he'll think I'm asleep already. But he'd roll over every night, and he'd ask me the same thing. Now, you, you might be thinking, don't even go there, because that's not what I'm thinking. He, he would roll over every night and say the same thing. He'd say, honey... Are you hungry? Now, hon, I, if I'm hungry, I would have eaten before I put all the dishes in the dishwasher. I would have eaten before I spent 20 minutes brushing my teeth. But a man, he rolls over, he says, are you hungry? Well, men talking code, he could care less if I'm hungry. What he's saying is, I'm hungry. And so I learned after a few weeks, okay, he's wanting to eat something. So I'd say, no, honey, I'm not hungry, but are you hungry? He'd say, yes, I'm hungry. And I'd say, well, what do you want? And he would say, well, what do you have? I'm thinking, I'm a short order cook now. I, I, I don't know. You buy the groceries. You should know what we have. You know, I, and I, so I'm like, what, what, what do you want? I don't know what I want. Well, if you don't know what you want, you're not that hungry. Don't tell me what I am. I'm hungry. I've had a nap. I'm ready to eat. All right. So what do you want? Oh, he doesn't know. So finally, it comes down to it. He wants Oreos and milk. Every night, he wants Oreos and milk. Now, I'm not the brightest bulb. You'd think I'd bring them up knowing that he wants Oreos and milk. But, and not just Oreos and milk, if I happen to go and get them and not get even numbers, I had to throw one away or eat it on the way up. 
because he would be offended if I brought him seven. I'd have to bring eight. Had to be even you, numbers. Men don't two at a time. Because one, one, one's ready, the other one's getting ready. I mean, that's the way you eat Oreo cookies. So I was trying to be sufficient. You're missing out on life. You are missing out on the finer things of life. I'm trying to follow what the word says here. I'm trying to be submitted. So after several weeks, I'm like, God, this isn't working. I'm doing this. But, I'm getting but, up. But, I'm going to go get, but, I get the milk. I'm getting the Oreos. Yeah, but this is the way she would I'd say, I want Oreos and milk. She'd say, okay, fine, sure. I'll go and get it for you. And she'd walk down. 13 steps in our house, stomp it. Open the door, bam, slam the door. Open the refrigerator, bam, slam the refrigerator. Pour the milk over the spit. She'd come back there and she'd be stomping. Here. Here you go, darling. So I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm being submitted. And he said, no, you're not. He said, you're going through the motions of it, but you're a slave to it. You are not doing it out of willful. You're not willfully going under the mission of a godly home. You're just doing it because I commanded you to do it. He said, you're putting gasoline on your seed every day you do it. You're getting no harvest off of your seed because your heart's not in it. I'm like, man, you want my heart in it too? <laughs> he began to show me. He said, in the Amplified, it says, do me a favor. Submit to your own husband as a service to the Lord. I looked up that word service. It means as a favor to the Lord. God is asking me to do him a favor, be submitted to my husband. Now I can do it because I'll do anything for the Lord. If it'll bring a happiness to a home, if it'll cause us to walk as one, then I'm going to do it because I do it for the Lord. And ladies, I'm telling you, when you submit to your husband, the Lord says, thank you, baby girl. You did good. Do it for the Lord and you can do it with the right heart and the right attitude. Now, if, if you take that in context of you go to a restaurant and you order food and waitress waits on you, what do you do at the end of the meal? You give her a tip. Or by giving her a tip by how good the service was, you say, thank you. See, this is where reciprocity comes in. It says, it says, Cheryl, you do this as a favor of a service unto the Lord. Gotcha. You see, what happens is most of the time men go to men's meetings and they say, well, we need to talk about marriage because we've got marriage problems in our church. And they, they get this scripture out and they say, the Bible says that you're supposed to have a submissive wife. And if you don't have a submissive wife, you don't have a godly wife. You don't have a godly wife. You don't have a godly home. So you go home and you tell that wife to be godly. She needs to be submissive to you. And he gets on American Airlines and flies to his next date, and you're sleeping in the Holiday Inn. Because you cannot take that out of context. You see, right there it says, there is something that a woman does. She has the capability to provide a favor unto God because he's asked her a service unto the Lord. But here's the reciprocity, and it says, for the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, himself the savior of his own body. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to everything in their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. We girls love to be loved. If you're not loving them, she'll find someone that will. Because that's all she wants. A woman wants security. She wants safety. She wants love. A woman knows you love her when you just take her hand and don't expect anything else. A woman knows that you love her when you get up and you do something for her that's unexpected for her that is out of your norm. She knows you love her. It's the little things that it doesn't cost very much. And then it goes on and says, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot nor wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and faultless. You don't need to start looking at your wife and telling her all her faults. No, a women woman already know all her own faults can look in the mirror and find every flaw that they have. And a hundred that's not even there. My wife will look in the mirror and say, oh, I've got this problem, I've got this crow's feet, I've got this thing, my this, and I look in the mirror and I say, you good looking thing, don't you ever die. Men love themselves. It's a good thing. We have great self-image. Women don't have good self-image just because here it says, it says because we are to say to them without fault. I married Miss America, so did you. Amen. You married the most beautiful woman that you'd ever seen in your life, and you decided that you were not only going to spend your life here with her, but eternity. And it goes on, it says, so even as husbands should love their wives, love being a sense their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. Mm -hmm. Lots of loving going on. 
When two become one, it's a great mystery. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and carefully protects and cherishes it as Christ does the church, because we are members or parts of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his mama and his father, his mama and his daddy, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one become. flesh. Become. Become. It's a progressive verb. It's not fairy dust. It's we're working on it. We're becoming one. We're becoming one. Everybody say, we're becoming one. However, each man of you without exception love his wife as being in a sense he love, 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 love. That, that let the wife see that she, res oh, wait a minute, now it shifted. Now the yes. wife respects him. And I love it in the Amplified. It's, so now the husband loves, the husband loves, the husband loves. Then it says, then it says and finishes up, however, let each man of you without exception love his wife. And then it gets down, it says, wives, see that she respects, she reverences her husband, that she notices him, that she venerates him, that she regards him, that she honors him. Honor means to open the door in the Hebrew. She prefers him, she esteems him, she defers to him, she praises him, she loves him, and she admires him exceedingly. Now, I love that because we women want all of that. We want the guy to do that for us, but God says, you do that for your husband, and I'll make sure your marriage is a God marriage. Now, do you have those slides, and we'll close with those. Yes, we, we could teach all night about agreement and about unity but because it's time. our life's message. But um, it came from understanding that we didn't know how to walk in unity, and God began to show us. And Harry said when we read the Word and there were so many scriptures, he said, prove it to me. So I began to search through the Hebrew, and I found particular words. Can we put up the first slide? Unity, I believe, is the first slide. And it says unity means strongly fence the door in the Hebrew, and that comes with the definition, strongly fence the door. That doesn't sound right for unity, does it? Strongly fence the door. But it comes from the way God intended for us to understand unity. Unity is a word picture in the Hebrew, and the word picture is this story. It's just say, um, when you come into this room right here tonight and a fire broke out, what would you do without thinking? I mean, there's a big old fire, what would you do? You'd run. You'd go to every E-X-I-T. You'd run to all the exits, wouldn't you? But here's what God says about unity. Strongly fence the door. What if you get to all the exits and they're all barred? They're all fenced. You can't get out. Then what would you do? Ah, oh, what? You put the fire out. That's right. Come God together. says Pray. unity is no exits. See, when a couple gets married, we dealt with this with our own children. When you can deal with the exit, see, this is what people do. They have a plan B in their brain. Oh, if this doesn't work out, this is my plan B. No, God says you cannot have a plan B when you walk in unity. You cannot have an escape plan. You cannot have an exit. God said every door, every exit is barred. You cannot get out. You got to learn how to stay and put out the fires. Unity. Let's go to the next one. Fire means strong devour. Anytime there's a fire, it's going to try to devour you. So let's look at the next one. The word male. Husband is the same word in Hebrew. It's three symbols. It means strongly and then devour. It means fire. And then in the middle, it's called the yud. It means his hand is in the midst of the fire. God intended for the male to keep his hand in the middle of an all-consuming fire God. Men are supposed to stay in the presence of God. Keep the fire of God going. And then let's look at wait, female. Wait, before you go on any farther, I want him to notice it says, this is the Hebrew definition. It's male slash husband. We were same created word. male. We were created husbands. But there, it does not say we were created man because the Bible says and when he became a man, chooses. He put become. away childish things. There is a process that we go through that's called maturing enough that we stop being the boy we used to be and we become the man of God he wants us to be. But that's your choice. It's right your choice. there, he gives us a choice to be a husband, be a man. That's right. Now, the female is the same word as wife in the Hebrew, they're not a separate word. And it Notice the two symbols that were in man, fire. It's also in the 
female. Two-thirds of male is fire. Every woman can attest that's true. Two-thirds of woman is fire. Two-thirds of the female is fire. And the last symbol there means what comes out of. So the woman comes out of the fire. Woman didn't come out of a rib of man. She came out of the fire of man. God intended for woman to come out of the fire of God's presence inside of mankind. And when you understand that you came out of the fire of God, you act different. You walk different, you talk different, you live different. But notice, when you go to the next slide, notice that the difference between male and female, there is a difference. And that difference is what the world would say is why we can't get along. That's, they say that's why you'll never get along, you'll always be different, you can't ever walk in agreement because women love women and men love men. But, the, but girls and boys, oh, they can't walk in agreement. But God says he created us on purpose different. We were created different on purpose because the difference in male and female, if you put them together, just the differences, it actually spells a word in ancient Hebrew. The word difference between male and female spells God, the Lord, in the land of the living. And it takes us to the scripture that says, where two of you agree on earth as touching anything, there I am in the midst of it. And that's why the enemy works so hard to keep you in disagreement. Because he knows the moment you come into agreement, God comes on the scene in your relationship. The minute you say, yes, I'm going to walk in agreement, God says, there I am in the midst of them. God created us different on purpose so we can choose to walk as one. And when we choose to walk as one, God says, I'll get in the middle. And what you couldn't fix, I'll fix for my glory. Now the scripture says, again I tell you, if two of you agree as anything, touching anything on this world, there I've I given am. to you. There I am. If two of you agree on anything, I am in the midst of you. Anything. Now, God is a gentleman. If my wife is screaming at me and I'm screaming at her, God's would you want to walk in the room? Neither does God. He said, but if you can agree on anything. I'll get in the middle of it. We had a couple that came to us and, and he walked up after one of our marriage conferences and she stood there and she said, well, I, I've heard everything you've, you've taught about. I said, but, but we, we do not agree on anything. Nothing. We just can't. And we've got our divorce papers in our hand. I said, well, you can't agree on it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I mean, she was just angry. I said, if I asked you what color is grass, what would you say? Green. He said green. If I asked you what color is the sky, blue, blue. Start there. Just start something. See, there's a way, if you look for it, that you can find agreement in your marriage. You can find one thing. I said, here's the bottom line is you both agreed to get divorced. <laughs> I said, so in the, in, the, in, the, in the worst of it, you found God in it because you found agreement. I said, you need to tear up those papers and work from the fact that it ain't going to get any worse than that. It's got to get better. And we all had to go through it. We went through it. I, I, I saw this. I saw the revelation of it. I wanted God in our marriage. I wanted God to change us. I wanted God to change me. And we got to where we could walk in agreement almost all the time, except in the car. I don't know what it is about the car, but in the car, it was tough. We had the hardest time walking in agreement in the car. And so uh, we would make a trip, and if we could stay in peace in the car, I was so excited. And we were like a mile from the house, and we were just getting this revelation. And, and this woman well, pulled out Well, you are the, the worst front. direction giver in the, in the history of the world. <laughs> well, anyway, we're, we're walking in agreement now. And so we're all in agreement, and we're almost home, and we're like a mile from the house. And this woman pulls out in front of of us and he starts this woman driver she, she and, and before when he would do that I'd say now honey don't get so upset because I'm thinking this is silly to be upset over another driver they can't hear you we're all listening to you yell and scream but she can't hear you so I would try to take you know the peace route and he would say why do you always take their side I didn't even know there was a side I wasn't even trying to take another side so this time the woman pulls out and he starts getting frustrated and the Holy Spirit rises up inside of me and the Holy Spirit says agree with him I'm thinking, now, if I agree with him, he's wrong. Now we're both going to be wrong. That seems silly. But God said, no, agree with him. I'm like, God, I don't understand. What do you mean agree with him? The Holy Spirit said at the third time, he said, agree with him. So I said, all right, okay. So I said, Harry, you're right. That woman's an idiot. She just pulled right out in front of us. What a stupid woman she is. I think you just need to run up there and run her car off the road and jump out. I'll jump out. I'll grab the tire too. You hold her down. I'll beat her with the tire too. Yes. <laughs> but 
when my wife gets excited, and you can tell she's not from California, she's a hillbilly from Mississippi. When she gets excited, that southern drawl that's buried deep in her starts to manifest out, and it's like having Ellie Mae Clampett sitting next to you in the car. And she says, that's right, you just go up there and mash him in the rear end, and I'll jump out and you hold him down, and I'll beat him with the tire tool. Now you hear you giggling, that's what happened. Our kids in the back seat, our daughter and our two boys started to giggle. We had a little van at the time. I started to laugh, I was laughing so hard that I could no longer drive down the road, so I pulled the car off the side of the road and all of us are laughing. Now I want you to understand something. The point is that when that woman pulled out in front of me, the car was full of anger, but even though I wasn't right, she agreed with me and God came God on the scene and the environment in went the from anger to pure laughter and joy. All for agreement. Now, it doesn't mean the other person has to be right, but if you can walk in agreement. God will come on the scene. God will come on the scene. God will come on the scene. That's what we're after. If you don't have God in the midst of your marriage, then all you've got is a good marriage. And good marriages don't last. God marriages God last. Marriage. You see, what the world is looking at is they say, oh, we have a good marriage. What's that mean? Well, we have an open marriage. What does that mean? Well, he can do whatever he wants to do. He can do that. That's a good marriage. Says who? Says the world. God doesn't say it that way. It says when two become one, let no man tear them apart. He says because it's not just a good marriage I'm looking at. I'm looking for a God marriage because today, when most of the world... See, the, the, the numbers for marriages have declined. I, I, I'm sorry, the number of divorces have declined. The reason is the number of marriages have declined. People have just decided not to get married. They're just going to live together. Common law. But you see, the Bible says when two become one. This is the interesting thing. When I think about atheists, they say atheists or agnostics or whatever. They don't believe in God. Are you married? Yeah. Are you in love? Yeah. Well, then you have to believe in God. Well, no, I don't believe in God. God is love. You see, I don't understand how some people think. See, God said, listen, I created male and I created female. He said, it's a good thing when a man finds a wife. He says that when they walk in the attributes that I put in him, half male, half female, and they get married and they come together, when they walk this face of the earth, see, my son walked as God incarnate. He didn't need a bride. He didn't need a wife. He didn't need a female sign because the female side was in him. He said, but when he left here, he gave you the ability to be male and female and get married and two become one. And when you walk in agreement, you look like me on the face of the earth. When you walk in disagreement and disharmony, you look exactly how Satan wants you to look. But when you can walk in agreement and love one another, the world will look at you and say, how are you doing what we can't do but for the love of God in my life? I ask you tonight, you see, you have to have that foundation. As Terrell said, the differences between male and female spells the word God. You have to have a foundation in your life. You see, if you're expecting God to give you a God marriage, he can't give you a God marriage if you haven't even invited him into your life. You might have invited him into your house, but have you invited him into your life? See, a lot of people have big crosses in their home and they might have a little light on a Bible. But have you invited him into your life? Hotels have Bibles in the doors, but have the people that stayed in the hotel invited him into their life? Doesn't mean that if there's a Bible in a hotel room that everybody that comes in there is saved. You must invite him into your life. What's that mean? It means you must be born again. If you do not have that born again experience, how can you ask God to be Lord of your marriage if he's not even Lord of your life? Pastor Dan said it earlier. He said, this is the last service of this year. In this, the, uh, 2013, the two words that would describe 2013 were rebellion and depravity. Rebellion and depravity. 2014 means Salvation and deliverance. You can leave rebellion and depravity behind. And you can go to salvation and deliverance. There's no better way to start off the new year than to get yourself right with the Lord. Because he can deliver you from any chain that's had you held in bondage. And he can give you the salvation that he's wanted you to have for years. Now I'm talking right to you right now, and you might be saying, wait a minute, uh, you know, I raised my hand in church, or my mom brought me to church. No, 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 I'm talking about you. 
You see, I said that I married a spiritual girl because I thought the spiritual girl, I had an in with God because a spiritual girl could talk to God and pray for me. No, he said, you must be born again. See, this is the message my wife and I have been taking to the United States for the last 10 years. You must be born again. You must accept the fact that Jesus Christ was born. He came in perfection and he came as a promise in the gift of a little baby. But he walked this earth as a man. He was crucified, dead, and buried. But because of what he did at Calvary, and his shed blood was for the remissions of your sins. He died for you. For this night, closing out 2013, so you can be free of what's held you and go to the promise of what he has in front of you. You must be born again. See, I pray that your marriages are strengthened. I pray that your household is strengthened. I pray that you find unity and peace together in your marriage. But more than that, beloved, the Bible says, beloved, above, above all things, I want you to prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. It says everything else is tied to the soulish realm. How can you expect to have a God marriage if you don't have God living inside of you? You must be born again. I'm going to ask you in the next 15 seconds that if you want me to pray for you, for your eternal life, let me tell you, there's going to come a day that you're going to stand before the Lord and see, I think everything comes down to 30 seconds in life. In 30 seconds in life, if I had anything to say to somebody, it, this is what I'd say to him. I know who the living God is. I know what eternity is all about. And I know that there's a heaven and I know there's a place for me because I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. If you do not know that, I can give you an opportunity in the next 10 seconds to get right with God so you can have an eternal life. In 30 seconds, you can change someone's eternal walk. It's that quick. And let me tell you, when you stand before the Father, He's going to look at you and you're going to stand before Him. And He might say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have entree into the kingdom of heaven forever and ever and ever. Less than 30 seconds. But you also could stand there and He'll look you square in the eye. And let me tell you, He is going to be as matter of fact as matter of fact can be. He's going to look you in the eye and say, you've called out my name. You've healed in my name. You've said prayers in my name, but I don't even know you. You do not have entree into the kingdom of heaven. He is a fair and just God. Just because you get a message that tickles your ears doesn't mean you're going to get to heaven. You must be born again. I need to change. I need to change. Don't you get that in your spirit? I need to change. I'm going to take 15 seconds. And at the end of 15 seconds, I want you to think about this. If you need to get right with the Lord and you want to close out this year, and turn your nose up at the devil and invite the Lord Jesus Christ into your life for the up and coming year. I'm going to ask you right now to slip your hand up in the house, quickly in the house. Anyone here? Running after God. I was so thankful this morning at Pastor Eddie's church. We had 18 people. I'm running after 18 wise people. I'm running after God. Maybe you've received him, but you have fallen short of the glory of God and he's just not an operation of your life and you want to rededicate your life. I'm going to ask you right now to slip your hand up in the house. So that if I know this, that everyone in this house tonight, should the Lord come or should you stand before him, you're going to be with the Lord. And you're going to hear those words, well done. I see one woman there. I'm going to ask you that slipped your hand up to do me a favor. Stand to your feet right now. Don't be embarrassed. You stand in the same spot that I was standing one time in my life, wherever that hand was here. And the lady over there, if you can ask you to stand up to your feet. I saw your hand over here. Come on, darling, stand up. I'm going to ask you to slip out of your seat and come right on down here with me because I want to welcome you into the kingdom of God because we're going to pray here in the next few moments. I know one thing about this church, and I know about your senior pastor and your associate pastors. They preach the full gospel of Jesus Christ. They preach the repentance. They, re they preach salvation. That's what the church is all about. You must be born again. Is there anyone else in the house that thinks they need to be down here right now? Because you can't think your way into heaven. You need to know that you're going to heaven. Anyone else in the house? I'll give you 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven. Thank you, sir. Six, five, four, 
Kevin, I want, to, want you to take the hand of your mate, your, your husband or your wife right now. I want to pray over you. Father, I thank you right now for those that have come as a couple. Father, I pray that one word, one nugget that we've said tonight gets in their spirit. That they got to turn loose of the baggage in their past. That they've got to find oneness and unity in their home. That they're not opening up every window and every door and looking for an escape. But Father, they want to have a godly home. And they're going to Katie bar the doors. And they're going to say, we're going to fight the good fight of faith. And we're going to stay the course. Because we made a choice to become one. And nothing and no one can tear us apart. And we stand on the word of God. When two become one, it's a great mystery. But our Father has entered into this relationship. Now, Lord, I ask you to do what's in your nature to do. To bring healing, deliverance to bring salvation into this home and bring provision into this home so that father when they go out every day the people will say there's something different in the way that you look you look like god and that you'll be glowing just like a pregnant woman glows because you've got the living god inside of you you're not god but you're a carrier he's going to go with you wherever you go and you'll be a living example in your marriage in jesus name those of you that are down here and just want to pray, it's called the prayer of salvation or the prayer of dedication or rededication. You might say, what do words mean? When Mary said, be it unto me, she received Jesus Christ into her life. It changed her life. And tonight, that same Jesus that came into her life, going to come into your life. It's a simple prayer, but let me tell you, it's a powerful word because it'll take away everything that you've done in your past. and It'll set you on the course to the future he has for you. Are you ready to pray? I'm going to ask everyone in this house to pray with me. Heavenly Father, tonight I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, never to be the same. I turn loose of my past. I live in the present with a guarantee in my future through Christ Jesus. My sins have been forgiven. I deny hell. And I'm on my way to heaven because of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. If you believe that with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, we seal it with amen and amen. If you turn around, there's someone behind you that want to pray for you and they want to take you off this way. And they just want to love on you. If you just go this way, Pastor Dan. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words, say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm gonna turn from sin and I'm gonna turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.